just real quick response here, uh, Fred. Um, some difficulties here might be, um, uh, you know, if you're going to use this ex explanation, how are you going to explain the notion of pure evil? I mean, pure is not necessarily good. I mean, you, you know, pure is, uh, you know, not, uh, so, I mean, it does have to do with, with, with substance, which is, um, you know, which, which, is, which is a term that they even use in, in ecological psychology. Uh, a substance is, you know, something that, that, that you find in your environment, or something that uh, exists in your environment. Um, it subsists. Uh, okay, so question: How how are you gonna how are you gonna justify the 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 metaphor of purity when we use it in the the idea of pure evil? Uh, uh purity. Uh, the second point is that purity seems to come come from um, being clean, uh, not necessarily uh, having to do with a gag reflex. Um, that, to me, I mean, I mean, I can see how how they were related, but it's not. You don't necessarily have to be gagging. Um, it could be, you know, having a, a dirty environment tends to uh, infect wounds. So there there is some idea of contamination there, but I don't know that 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 people when this metaphor had originated were necessarily had a no some you know a notion of of contamination uh, in the medical sense. I mean. Having it, putting somebody in a dirt, dirty environment, and they have, they had a, had cuts and wounds, they would get infected, they they would die. So, um, you know, it could have to do, it has to do with, with uh, a whole environment, and it certainly is embodied, but I don't see it as being, um, yeah, I don't see it as being necessarily having to do with the yuck factor or or, or gagging. Uh, yuck factor is a term that some as a philosopher who, who re researches uh, the significance of the yuck factor I can find I find it for you if you want there's a podcast on it uh, I think on philosophy bites podcast um, so also the idea of purity purity as morality is if you're interested is is covered in um, in uh, Lakoff and Johnson's book in called moral uh, or uh, philosophy in the flesh it starts on page 307 I haven't read it but uh, I mean, it's not available online or the whole thing. But um, you know, I I do see that there is. It says uh, a substance is pure when there is no admixture of any other substance within it. A common impurity is dirt. Thus, uh, substances that are pure and typically clean are substances that are uh, and substances that are dirty are usually considered impure. Uh, this correlation between purity and cleanliness gives rise to the metaphor purity is cleanliness. Thus, when morality is conceptualized as purity and purity as cleanliness, we get the derived metaphor morality is cleanliness. There's nothing inherent in the notion of, so you're going to see the, the, where I got the, the point the point earlier, uh, there is nothing inherent in the notion of purity that aligns it with goodness. There can be pure evil just as well as pure goodness. However, in the moral realm, purity takes on a positive value. Remaining pure is a good and desirable thing, while impure, having impure thoughts, is seen as is seen as bad. And that's where, for me, it cuts off. Uh, that, again, I'm reading from Google Google Books, which is you know books .google .com, uh, and it picks up later again. Um, uh, it picks up. I, I start. It picks up. It starts on page 307. Page 308 is not available to me, and it ends on page 309. You can go there and, and, and read it if you want. Uh, it looks like they have some pretty interesting ideas there, um, on 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 a topic that you're interested in. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the reason why you're interested in this. Maybe you've maybe you've already seen it. I don't know. Um, yeah, but I, I think that 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 purity could be seen as coming from. Uh, the 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 gag response of the body, sure, but it probably also comes from uh, from just uh, situated in an environment. Traditionally, when you want to when you want someone in your community, I'm thinking you know long long time ago when you want someone in your community who has an infection uh, to survive, you don't put them in a, in a dirty environment. You put them put them in a clean environment, um, uh, an organized, well organized, and uh, free from from dirt, basically. Uh, uh, you know, of course, later on, there's lots of met metaphors. It was, it was, it was split off. But um, also, you're, you, 
to talk about more generally about about metaphors and language. Uh, I mean, metaphors and language, I think you're ultimately going to get back to uh, a material notion for the, in the etymology of almost almost every word. I mean, except for, you know, highly abstract things, uh, you know, abstractions from actions, like re things like relation and uh, re relations and categories, et cetera, et cetera, rather than re uh, abstractions from perception, which would be things like triangles, red, sense, data, you know, those are all abstractions that, words that are abstractions that come from, from perception, whereas the other ones are, are purely formal. Uh, so, so there are material abstractions which come from perception and touch, uh, and then there are, uh, and other sense modalities, I'm, I'm uh, probably, uh, come from vision and touch, and then there, there are formal ones that, that come from action, which is over time, so your you know the way that you arrange things and the way that things are related, you know these come through actions. There aren't things you, you can't see a relation uh, that comes through uh, through through organizing things, putting them together in a in a, in a certain way. Uh, that that that's Piaget's distinction, and, and it maps on to to Husserl's distinction of the material and formal essences. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. So so my point is that if you look in in uh, books on on etymology. Um, I can't think of the one right now that I'm thinking of. I think it's by a guy, his last name is, I can't remember it right now, but he, he has a quote in there that goes back to one of the, the foremost respected uh, etymologists in the 18, late 1800s, and he says that uh, an etymologist, is, I'm you know, paraphrasing here, uh, an etymologist usually never feels that, that their work is done in, until they have found the, the, the material source from which uh, the etymology of a word has come. And uh, it seems that uh, humans were the animals, this is his theory, and a couple of other people's theory too, uh, humans were the animals that, that went around and, and they would mimic every other animal. And uh, we, we, we would get a lot of our ideas uh, from the environment, and then we would then, you know, I guess you could say project back on the environment those, those metaphors. So uh, someone who, you know, has a... Uh, is a stone cold killer. I mean, you know, it's not like, you know, it's not like some caveman had some, you know, was very poetic and was like, you know, you look, uh, you look, you look hard. You have a hard look to you, you know. And then everyone in the community was like, whoa, wow, that, you know, their eyes lit up as like he had this metaphorical genius. No, no, it came through, um, you know, our ability to, you know, this, this is the mystery. Is how, how do we take. Uh, how do we name things? Say that oh, this thing is this thing is hard, and then uh, and then apply it to to people. Um, and, and I don't think it's an anthropomorphic thing. I don't think that we apply human characteristics to things. It'd be pretty difficult to explain how you know the idea of you know sheepish sheepish behavior and you know, how did that come about. Uh, I don't think it's from that. I think it's about um, you know communities of people interacting in certain ways, practices coming come into come into existence. And that's what we model our words words on, and the way it spreads. Who knows? Uh, Gabrielle Tarde was a soci sociologist. That's T A R D E, Tarde. Uh, awesome to read. Fun, fun, interesting. Uh, he has said that there were three laws: repetition, uh, opposition, and and and, uh, and uh, adaptation, which applied to the way language spreads. So that's that's you should look into that. He's really interesting. Uh, he's been picked up by Deleuze. Um, uh, Deleuze has uh, was was highly influenced by him. Um, yeah, so I guess that's it. Uh, there was one other thing I guess I was going to say, but I think that's it. Can't think of the other thing. I don't want to. I don't want to keep you. So that's it.